So the first lecture is fluid and electrolyte therapy in surgery. Now you should all know this form, it forms one of the bases, one of the basic principles in the management of any patient to be able to administer fluid appropriately for any patient that it's indicated and to be able to correct any form of electrolyte derangement that is noticed because fluid and electrolyte, they form the milieu for normal homeostasis to occur in the body. Now, you should understand um, basic principles surrounding fluid administration, fluid complications, and corrections of those complications. And you should also know areas of interest in your exams, as well as areas of interest with regards to your practice, especially as a house officer. Where are those areas you need to, a kind of a must know areas? Now, our outline will discuss under this topic, body fluid co compositions, fluid balance, electrolyte balance, fluid and electrolyte therapy. We'll talk about uh, imbalances like dehydration and fluid overload. Then we'll now talk about electrolyte imbalance. Now, by way of introduction, you should know that fluid and electrolyte homeostasis is essential requirement for optimum cellular and organ function. And this knowledge is useful in the management of surgical patients as well as surgical condition. The basic principles of patient management is understanding the normal body homeostasis, which if there is a fluid um, and electrolyte um, imbalance between these compartments, you have affectation of movement of electrolytes and other useful molecules across compartments. Now, this is a very important aspect you should know regarding total, uh, that is body fluid composition, the total body water. Total body water forms 60% of body weights in males, 50% of body weights in females. Of course, it is higher in males, because males have more, okay? The, the males have more um, muscle mass, okay? They have more muscle mass. And muscle tend to have more water. Okay, than fat. Females have more body fat and hence they have less body water. Okay. So this total body water depends on some certain factors. One, age of the patient. Age of the patient. Extremes of age, like in the pediatric age group. Now for new needs, for example, they have higher body water
per kilogram body weight. Now, if you take one kg of a neonate tissue, it has more water content than in an adult. That is the meaning of saying the neonates have higher body water per kilogram body weight as compared to adults. And of course, you see this tends to gradually equilibrate with that of adults as the child grows steadily. By the age of two years, it starts equilibrating. It equilibrates with that of adults. Now, if you grow older, what happens? The total body water reduces because as a patient grows older, the muscle mass atrophies. It reduces, and you know, muscles have more water content, okay? Yes, muscles have more uh, water content. So as an individual grows older, the muscle mass reduces. Hence, the total body water in elderly reduces. Their fat content increases as they grow older. So the total body water in elderly reduces. So you can see at the extreme of ages. In the pediatric age group, you have more body water per kilogram body weight as compared to the elderly that has less body water per kilogram body weight. Sex, we've explained that. Obesity, okay? The obese tends to have lesser body water. Now, you should know that the total body water is divided into two compartments. The intracellular compartment, that is the compartment within the cell, and it forms the bulk of the total body water. It forms 40% of the body weight. Why? extracellular compartments forms 20% of the body weight. That is the total water that is outside the cell. Now it is very important you know these values because of your multiple choice questions, which these values can be played around multiple choice questions. The extracellular compartments that makes up 20% of body weight is further divided into intravascular, okay? You have a cell, fluid within cells are intravascular, intracellular. Fluid outside cells are extracellular. Then, in the extracellular, you have a space within the vessels are called intravascular. Then fluid in between these cells are called interstitial, the fluid here, okay? Okay, they are interstitial or extravascular. So broadly, total body water that makes up 60% is divided into ICF, 40%, ECF, 20%. The ECF is further divided into intravascular which is basically plasma fluid and extravascular and the extravascular has two 
compartments, okay? The extravascular has both the interstitial as well as and cellular. Interstitial is the fluid collection in between cells. While transcellular fluids are fluid within co collected cavities or spaces that are not in direct flow on continuity with the extravascular compartment. For example, the CSF fluid. Fluid within the joints, fluid within the eye wall. All these are examples of transcellular. What are their percentages? Now it is when talking about these percentages, you have some confusion where they tend to play with the values. So fluid within the intravascular space that forms the plasma is 5% of the total body weight, while extravascular forms 15, of which the transcellular makes up 1% and interstitial makes up 14%. Now, this is very important during fluid resuscitation, because if you know the maximum amount of fluid that saturates the intravascular space is 5%. When you start giving fluid that exceeds this 5%, they tend to move into the interstitial space. And when they move into the interstitial space, patient will develop edema, okay? And the, the organs that are involve early include the brain and the lungs. Patient will have cerebral edema when you are overloading them with fluid because you are giving fluid that exceeds the maximum saturation of that space, okay? Or it enters, it enters the, what do you call it? It enters the interstitium of the lungs and patients will develop pulmonary edema. That's why during fluid resuscitation, amongst the monitoring you do is frequent auscultation of the lungs so that you don't overload the patient with fluid. So you should know the significance of all this compartments. Now, what are the distribution of ions in the various compartments? Now, the intravascular has sodium as the highest electrolyte, <clears throat> which is about 140 millimoles while you have 143 in the interstitial and eight in the intracellular fluid. Now questions usually come around this. The most important intracellular cation is what? The most important extracellular cation is what? The most important ion in a compartment is that ion that determines the movement of water in and out of that compartment. So sodium is the most important extracellular cation. Sodium is the most important extracellular cation. Now, if you look at potassium now, 
in the intravascular or interstitial, that is the extracellular compartment, it is just what? Four millimoles per liter. While in the intracellular compartment, potassium is 140 millimoles per liter. Now, potassium is the most important uh, is the most important intracellular cation, okay? Potassium is the most important intracellular cation. Now, these two are very, very important in movement and exchange of electrolyte between cellular membrane, especially sodium. That's why even the hydration is defined by the concentration of sodium within a compartment, which we'll see shortly. Now look at the concentration of calcium in various compartments. This table shows you the various electrolytes and their um, um, concentration in various compartments. And we've talked about two important cations sodium and potassium. Now, let's talk about the anions, the most important extracellular anion is chloride. The most important extracellular anion is chloride. It forms the bulk of the negatively charged ion in the extracellular compartment. The most important intracellular anion, the most important intracellular anion is phosphate. Now you see MCQs regarding this, comparing phosphate and protein, because phosphate are, and protein are the predominant intracellular, okay, anions. But you should know the concentration of phosphates within the cell is more than the concentration of proteins within that cell. So making phosphates the most important intracellular anion. So pay attention to these five electrolytes we mentioned, as well as the compartment, they exert their most important effects. Now, it is very important for you to know the commonly used IV fluids. When you become house officers and you, uh, you don't know how to use, uh, you don't know how to use fluid uh, appropriately, that must be, <laughs> it will be a very challenging problem. You don't just choose any fluid just based on your choice and administer. It is based on the indication or the requirements of that fluid, okay? And secondly, you should know that these fluids have some certain component and it's based on those components they are administered, okay? Now, before we go come to this table, let's look at some important ones, normal saline.
bring us lactates. Dextrose water. Dextrose water. So let's look at this. Okay. Okay, I'm seeing a message that somebody can't connect. They can't hear. That person should use another device to connect. The problem is from his device. Ask the person to use another device to connect. Okay, normal saline. Normal saline has sodium chloride and water. These are the constituent of normal saline. What is the concentration of this sodium and chloride in normal saline? It has sodium chloride 0.9%. It is called 0.9%. This is in terms of weight. That is 0.9 grams per 100 mils or nine grams of sodium chloride in one liter of water. This is the weight of sodium chloride in one liter of water, which translates to 154 millimoles of sodium and 154 millimoles of chloride. Now, you should know this and you should never forget it. Normal saline is called 0.9% saline, that is nine grams of sodium chloride in one liter of water. It contains 154 millimoles of sodium and 154 millimoles of chloride in one liter of water. This is one of the commonly prescribed IV fluids, normal saline. Ringer's lactates, on the other hand, or lactated ringers, is the most physiologic IV fluid. You shouldn't forget this. Ringer's lactates is the most physiologic. Why is Ringer's lactate the most physiologic? It is the most physiologic because the constituents of Ringer's lactate are similar to the constituents of that of the plasma, which you will see, okay? We'll see the values of Ringer's lactate on that table we highlighted. Dextrose water, has glucose or dextrose in water. Now the concentration of this dextrose in water depends on the percentage. When you say 5% dextrose water, it means you have five grams of dextrose in 100 mils, okay? of water or you have 50 grams of dextrose or glucose per liter. That is the meaning. Anywhere you see 5% dextrose, it means you have five grams per 100 mils or 50 grams per liter, okay? If you have 10, 10% uh, dextrose water. 10% dextrose water means there is what? 100 grams per liter. 
50%, okay? It means you just keep on adding um, zero, okay? That means you have 500 grams if you are taking one liter of this. So, so there are various types of, of dextrose which you should know. Now let's go back to that table, okay? And discuss the commonly used intravenous fluids and their constraints. Now, the first one that is highlighted here, and you should know, these fluids, these fluids are classified into crystalloids. and colloids. But the ones we we'll talk about here are basically crystalloids. That is, crystals dissolve in water and they present as clear, low molecular weights, okay? They present as low molecular weights. They present as clear aqueous fluid of low molecular weight. Those are crystalloids. These are the ones we are talking about here. Now, 5% dextrose water. I already explained what it means. What are the constraints? You can see it has 50 grams of glucose in one liter of water. And when you see the bags, these bags press come in either 500 mils or they can come in um, a liter. Most of the fluid you see, they either come in 500 mils or they come in one liter. I look at the osmolality. The osmolality of this fluid is 278 uh, milliosmoles. Now look at Ringer's lactate. I want you to pay attention to the constraint of Ringer's lactate because we said the osmolality of uh, Ringer's lactate is similar to that of the plasma as the constraint, so that makes it the most physiologic crystalloid because the constraints are similar to that of the plasma. Okay, what are the constraints? Sodium, 130, uh, 130, um, millimoles of sodium, which is around the range of that of the plasma. If you look at potassium, four millimoles, calcium, four millimoles, chloride, 111, bicarbonate, 217, and the osmolality of Ringer's lactate is 276. So Ringer's lactate is the most physiologic IV fluid. So you go and check as an assignment, the normal composition of all these electrolytes in the plasma. You will see it is within the range of the constraint of Ringer's lactate. Now the osmolality of the plasma is around 275 to 290 milliosmoles. <clears throat> now, this gives you an idea of which solution is regarded as a hypertonic solution. Okay, hypertonic solution. And this determines 
how you administer fluid, okay? Because if the osmolality is within the range of that of the plasma, it's regarded as an isotonic IV fluid. Normal saline, we said the constraint of sodium is 154 millimoles. It doesn't have this, it doesn't have this. It has 154 millimoles of chloride. It doesn't have bicarbonate. It doesn't have glucose. And it has 308 milliosmoles. You can see it is slightly hypertonic. You see another reason why Ringer's lactate is preferred to normal saline. Aside having similar constraint to that of the plasma, the osmolality is within the range of serum osmolality, plasma osmolality. Okay, now 5% dextrose saline. Now, you should take note of this to IV fluid. I find a lot of residents confusing this when administering, and a lot of house officers as well. Take note the difference between um, dextrose water and dextrose saline, please, when you are administering this fluid. Take note, I told you, when you see saline, okay, it's sodium chloride, okay? If you see saline on any fluid, it's sodium chloride. If you say normal saline, it's just sodium chloride and water. If you say dextrose saline, it means that saline, but dextrose is added to it. If you say 5% dextrose saline, you are adding, okay, 50 grams of dextrose into a liter of, okay, into a liter of normal saline. Now, when you say 5% dextrose water, 50 grams of dextrose in one liter of water. If you say 5% dextrose saline, okay, you have 50 grams of, uh, of dextrose in a liter of normal saline. So what do you expect? This will be hyperosmolar. The osmolality of Dextrose solar will be very, very, it will be very high. So you can't be giving this as a maintenance loop by saying, okay, it has uh, the same constraint. You will just be distorting uh, the menu. Now look at, look at the osmolality. You see, it has 154 millimoles of sodium. 154 millimoles of chloride, 50 grams of dextrose, 586 millimoles of uh, osmolality, milliosmoles. Now, even the pediatric saline, because it's a combination of, it is called 4.3% dextrose in one fifth saline. So that's, Saline here, pediatric saline is one fifth saline. That 154, you divide it by five, you will get 30.8 millimoles of sodium, 30.8 millimoles of chloride, and this 4.3% dextrose, 43 grams of dextrose in, hundred, uh, in one mil, one liter of water, or 4.3% in 100 mils. And you can see the osmolality is high because it's a combination. Now, 
you need to pay attention to this fluid called Darus, please. Darus solution is a potassium containing IV fluid. The sodium is 124, lower than Ringer's lactate, but look at the potassium, 36 millimoles per liter. Most of the time, Daro solution is administered because of the potassium content of it. And there are two types of Daro solution. You have full strength Daros. and half strength Daros. Now, full strength Daros has 36 millimoles of potassium in one liter of water, while half strength Daros have 18 millimoles. So you should take notes depending on what you are prescribing and what requirement, what is the requirement of potassium in the one? Even though we don't routinely use this for potassium correction, we use KCL, we'll discuss that in detail. Now, we've seen the various composition of fluids in the compartments, the, their percentage. We've seen the various compositions of electrolytes, and we've seen the commonly prescribed intravenous fluids. Now let's talk about the balance, fluid and electrolyte balance. Let's start with fluid balance. You know, intake, for you to achieve balance, total fluid intake should be equal to total output. Total input should be equal to total output. Now, you should know that intake of fluids are from two sources, exogenous sources and endogenous sources. Exogenous sources are external, fluid given orally or parenterally through intravenous access or other parenteral routes. Endogenous are sources of fluid that are generated from metabolism. They are product of metabolism. If you remember your biochemistry, where carbon hydrate is broken down to release water and energy plus carbon dioxide that is liberated. Energy is utilized by the tissues and water is generated. That water that is generated is an endogenous source and it must also be balanced with the input and output. So these are the two sources. Now, for you to administer fluid, you should have this at the bottom of your mind that fluid you don't just administer based on your choice. You just feel like giving a patient five liters of fluid. If you remember, I told you, you must know the percentage of these compartment. Intravascular compartment forms 5% of total body Wait, if you start giving so much fluid, what will happen? They will move out of this compartment into the interstitial compartment, causing fluid overload, which is detrimental. Now, the food fluid you administered is based on the total fluid that is lost from the body. And this varies in the tropics as well as the temperate region. Now we are going to concentrate on the tropics. The total urine output in 24 hours is 1,500 mils. That is 
liters in 24 hours. That is the total urine output in the tropics. The total fluid that is passed in the feces in 24 hours is 200 mils. The total insensible loss from the skin via sweating as well as the lungs through breathing is 1,700 mils in 24 hours. Insensible loss forms the highest amount of fluid loss in the tropics. Of course, because of the hotter environment. Now, you should know that the total fluid that is lost in the tropics is 3,400 mils in 24 hours. And you remember, for fluid to be balanced, you know, input must be equivalent to what output. Now, inputs, don't forget, product of metabolism generates 200 mils of fluid, product of metabolism generate 200 mils. So now next balance is the total loss. This is gain. The net balance will now be the difference of this two, which is 3,200 mils. So this is the total fluid that is lost from the body in the tropics in an adult. Now, if you are replacing fluid, it must be equivalent to these 3,200 mils so that the total input must be equal to the total output. So this is how the fluid that is required by a patient that is on NPO, is not taken par orally, is replaced parenterally. This is based on all the amount of fluid he loses in 24 hours. However, we shall see a little modification on a surgical patient. What is the modification in a surgical patient? A surgical patient on parenteral fluid, IV fluids is unlikely to be taking orally or passing feces. He's on NPO, nil per oral, because his surgical condition warrants that he has intestinal obstruction, you can't tell him to take per oral. Or he has peritonitis. And because of that, or intestinal obstruction, or peritonitis is not passing stool. So you want to give him, it means you are going to deduct these 200 meals from a surgical patient because it's not passing stool. It's on nail power, it's not passing stool. So the total requirements, instead of 3,200 mils, a surgical patient will require 3,000 mils or three liters in 24 hours. Okay? A surgical patient will require three liters in 24 hours. Now, you should also know um, in pyrexic patients, patient that has fever, if you remember, we said that in the tropics, their insensible loss is higher because of a hotter environment. They tend to lose beyond that 1,700 um, mils because of a hotter environment. Now,
you should know that 12% of daily requirements is added for every degree rise in temperature to compensate for sweating. If you have a total maintenance of a patient to be, let's say, five liters, for example, or let's use three liters. If a total maintenance of the patient is three liters and that patient is having fever. So for every degree rise in temperature, you calculate 12% of these three liters and add it to three liters to compensate for what? The fluid loss, increased insensible loss. As if you remember, insensible loss is higher, which is 1,700 mils. So that is how we derive the amount of flu that is being administered from a patient based on the total losses from various parts of the body. Now, electrolyte balance now in the tropics, we are concentrating on the tropics, the urine, sodium, total sodium loss in millimoles per 24 hours is 114 millimoles in sweat, is 10 to 16 millimoles in feces, okay? 10 millimoles, total of 140, 130 to 140. If you remember, your surgical patient is unlikely to pass through. So you, you remove this. So you have around 130 millimoles. And if you remember the constituent of Ringer's lactates. It has 130 millimoles of sodium. Now, look at potassium now in urine, 50 millimoles is lost. In the sweat is negligible. In the feces is 10. Total loss is 60. So daily requirement is 60. However, in a surgical patient that is not passing through, daily requirement could be 50 millimoles. Now to summarize, to summarize the requirement of total body water, we should know that um, the total sodium requirement, the total water the total daily requirement for water in the tropics is three liters in a surgical patient. So when you are administering fluid, your maintenance fluid, you know that in that 24 hours, it's three liters you are giving that patient. The total amount of sodium you are administering is 130 millimoles. Potassium, 50 millimoles. Carbon hydrate, you should give 100 grams. We'll talk about that briefly. Okay? Now, of course, you know, this patient is not taken orally. It, that patient depends on you to provide all these via parenteral routes. So you must know what the patient requires. And why are we adding carbon hydrates to the fluid? All these requirements are provided via one liter of Ringer's lactate or one liter of normal saline plus two liters of 5% dextrose water, two liters. Okay, let's say you give one liter of Ringer's lactate and two liters of dextrose, 5% dextrose water. So this one plus two, have provided the three liters. Okay, we are done with water now. We are done with water. Okay. 
What else? Sodium. If you remember, if you are using Ringer's lactates, one liter of Ringer's lactates, this one liter of Ringer's lactate will provide 130 millimoles. If you are using normal saline that has 154 millimoles, you see the excess of 154 millimoles will be excreted in the kidneys. The body will only retain the daily requirement and the excess will be excreted in the kidneys. You see the reason why even in hyponatremia, which we'll discuss, you still use normal saline in correcting hyponatremia. Why? Because it has excess of what this plasma requires. As instead of excreting the excess of 130, excess from 154, it is retained to correct the deficit. We will talk about that. So, if you use Ringer's lactate, you have provided the daily requirements for the sodium. Now, two liters of 5% dextrose water. What is this dextrose doing here? Is to provide carbohydrates. Because we said one liter of dextrose will provide 50 grams. Two liters will now provide 100 grams, okay? Potassium chloride will be used, will be added to this fluid, these three liters, to provide the daily requirement of potassium. These vitamins are all antioxidants that are required for metabolism. Now let's talk about the reason we add carbon hydrates to our IV fuels. We should know that if a patient is on NPO, meal per hour, that means you are starving. You are starving that patient. Patient is on what? Starvation. Where will the patient derive energy from? This energy will be derived from stored glucose in form of glycogen in the liver. Now, this stored glucose, glycogen that is converted into glucose is utilized within 24 hours. So if the stored glucose in the liver is utilized within 24 hours, what will happen to a patient that is starving? Where will they derive their energy from? They derive their energy from a process that is called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. That is mobilization of energy from what? Non-carbohydrate source non-carbohydrate sources like proteins and fat. You see, that's why when a patient is starving, within 24 hours, they use up the glucose storage. They now start mobilizing energy from the body's protein and fat which are the muscles and fat deposit, and patient will start losing weight. 
okay? You see, because you are starving them, they have to feed from their own body, mobilizing energy from their protein source stores, their muscles, you start seeing temporal recession, prominent zygoma, intercostal recession, losing weight, yes. Subcutaneous deposits will be lost. So that's why you need I, uh, you need glucose in the IV fluid you administer. But you should know that this glucose, 100 grams is not enough. What does the 100 gram does? The carbohydrates in IV fluids, what does it do? It minimizes, it minimizes gluconeogenesis. What does it do? It minimizes gluconeogenesis. So you should know that any patient that will be on NPO for greater than five days, for greater than five days, should be on TPN, parenteral nutrition, total parenteral nutrition. Any patient you want to starve because of his surgical condition, intestinal obstruction, peritonitis, and you know that this patient will be on MPO for more than five days, he should be on what? Parenteral nutrition. Because if patient is under starvation, even normal homeostasis will be affected. Okay, let's continue. Yes. What is the role? We've talked about the glucose. Now, potassium chloride. KCL, you have, you add one gram in each of the liter you are given in 24 hours. So within 24 hours, you've added three grams because you are given three liters in 24 hours, and the vitamin C and B are antioxidants, okay? Now, this is the summary. We talked about the summary of that. Now, what are the principles? If you will forget everything in this lecture today, you shouldn't forget the principles of fluid and electrolyte therapy in a surgical patient. This forms the basis on how you treat patients with IV fluid. The principles of fluid and electrolyte therapy in a surgical patient are four. Correction of deficits, replacement of ongoing loss, maintenance fluid and monitoring of the patient. If a patient presents with a deficit, you cannot place him on three liters in 24 hours. You have to correct that deficit. And if the deficit is corrected, then you now place him on his daily maintenance, which is three liters in 24 hours. And also, if a patient has deficits, you correct it, you place patient on his maintenance, which is three liters, and there's still ongoing loss. He's losing fluid continuously from vomiting, or he's losing fluid from diarrhea, or he's losing fluid from enterocutaneous fistula. You have to be replacing an equivalent amount of fluid into his daily maintenance fluid. If he vomited 100 meals, instead of giving him three liters, you give him 3.1 liters because he has vomited 100 meals. That is an ongoing loss. He passed a stool of 200 meals. You have to replace that, okay? Yes. So the principles 
of fluid and electrolyte therapy in a surgical patient include correction of deficits, replacement of ongoing loss, provision of maintenance fluid, and monitoring. You can't be giving patient fluid gallons and gallons of fluid without monitoring the patient, whether the fluid you are giving is enough, okay? Or you are giving more than enough. So you have to monitor the patient. In giving fluid therapy, it must be indicated. Don't just, the patient just come to you that I feel like having IV fluid because I have malaria. You have to assess the patient. Is the patient dehydrated? The dehydration, is it mild? Can it be corrected orally? If the patient can take orally using ORS or do you need to give parenteral? So the fluid therapy must be indicated. And if you are giving parenteral fluid, intravenous access under a septic condition must be secured. And you must know how to estimate the rate of intuition and the total amount of fluid that is to be administered, which I will show you. The drip set, the needle and vein, except for cut down, should be changed every 48 hours to reduce the incidence of thrombophlebitis. But commonly, you will see us, you have a patient with a cannula for 10 days, you are still using it. And of course, when you remove that cannula, what happens to the patient? That vein will be inflamed. They will have thrombophlebitis. They will be suffering severe pain in that vein you use in giving fluid. But however, because of some peculiarities, we leave, you will see some of the cannulas are left for more than 48 hours because maybe a patient has a very difficult intravenous access, okay? Especially in the pediatric age group. But if you have a patient with so many prominent veins, it's preferable you remove and replace after 48 hours to prevent the risk of thrombophlebitis. Now, if you have to administer fluid parenterally, don't forget, you have to catheterize the patient to monitor the urine output. Why is that so? Monitoring of the urine output. You should know that urine output is the most important marker for adequate tissue perfusion. So it's the most important indicator for adequate tissue perfusion. That's why you pass catheter to monitor urine output in a patient receiving fluid. So we are going to see some fluid problems and electrolyte problems. We'll, see, we'll start with deficits. And commonly, when you talk about deficit, we talk about what dehydration. Dehydration, patient that is dehydrated has a deficit of fluid. Dehydration simply means loss of water and electrolyte. And this is what, especially sodium. That is what dehydration is all about. Loss of fluid, water and electrolyte, especially sodium. And for patient to have moderate dehydration, up to 4% of his body weight must have been lost. And you should know dehydrations are two types, acute dehydration and chronic dehydration. When you say acute dehydration, is sudden water loss, sudden water and electrolyte loss, and is predominantly from the extracellular compartment, extracellular fluid. When a patient suddenly start vomiting, start losing fluid via diarrhea, okay? He's losing from the extracellular compartment. That is an acute dehydration. Because of the collapse of the extracellular compartment, which comprises of the what? I, 
intravascular compartment as well as the interstitial compartment, patients will rapidly have what reduction in their blood pressure. So that's why in sudden dehydration, you see drop of the blood pressure because there's sudden collapse of the fluid compartment within the vessels of that patient. There's sudden collapse of the fluid within the interstitial space. That is called acute dehydration. You shouldn't forget, it's a sudden loss of what? ECF. Chronic dehydration usually occurs gradually, and it is a loss of both the ECF and the ICF. And you should know, patient with uh, chronic dehydration, correction is not done rapidly because patient with acute dehydration, the sudden loss, you give rapid replenishment to build up the ECF. But in chronic dehydration that has suffers gradual loss, you replace gradually. So to avoid fluid overload and to avoid central pontine demyelinosis. So you go and read about it. Okay. You should also know the hydration is also classified as mild, moderate, and severe. You say a patient has mild dehydration when there is loss of less than 5% of body weight. And this is corrected per oral. If it, in a patient that can take oral, parenteral usually are corrected in moderate and severe dehydration. When the loss is between five to ten percent, you regard that as moderate dehydration. And when it is greater than ten percent, patient has a severe dehydration. Now, causes of dehydration: vomiting. When a patient has nasogastric tube and there's a consistent drainage from the nasogastric tube, patient will have dehydration if you are not replacing what patient requires. Patients having barriers to interstitial shift in bands, peritonitis, paradictic ileus, intestinal obstruction, these are called third space, third space loss. Water accumulates in a space that is not in continuity with the intravascular space. It cannot be utilized. It accumulates fluid and electrolytes in this compartment that is even detrimental to the body. That is a third space loss. Loss from an entrocutaneous fistula, excess sweating, polyuria, all these are causes of dehydration. How do they present? It's a spectrum of presentation depending on mild to what? Severe. However, they have dry inelastic skin with loss of skin to go. Dry mouth, sunken eyes, collapsed veins with tachycardia slightly concentrated urine or concentrated urine. They could have metabolic alkalosis. When the vomiting is predominantly coming from the stomach in GOO, only the stomach, there's obstruction at the pylorus, predominant vomiting is what? HCL, and they will have metabolic alkalosis because they are losing acid, okay? They are losing acid. When they are having diarrhea, they are predominantly losing bicarbonate, okay? And they will become acidotic. They will have metabolic acidosis. 
if the vomiting is coming predominantly from the intestine, they also lose bicarbonate and become acidotic. Okay. How do you investigate them? You do electrolytes, urea, creatinine, fat cell volume, but we don't, uh, more reliably, we do HB because the PCV is a function of red cell mass and the plasma. If you have loss of plasma, you have a relatively elevated PCV, which is false. Okay. In other words, PCV is affected by dehydration. It is after rehydrating patient, if you repeat the PCV, that is when you get a true picture. However, the HB, which is the hemoglobin concentration, is not affected by dehydration. Urinalysis, then you treat the cause of uh, the dehydration accordingly, the cause of vomiting, the cause of diarrhea. Okay, how do you replace IV fluid? For moderate to severe dehydration, for oral, if it is mild, you can correct orally using ORS, oral rehydration solution for patient that can take orally. For moderate to severe, you have to secure intravenous access. You use normal saline or Ringer's lactates. Fast over 30 to 45 minutes if it is a severe dehydration or up to one hour if it is moderate dehydration. After giving a liter, you assess the patient. What will you be reassessing if you are giving IV fluid? How do you monitor patient? You take the pulse rate of the patient. You take the BP of the patient. You take the urine output of the patient, okay? You take the central venous pressure for those who have central venous monitoring, okay? You auscultate the lungs of the patients, okay? Now, the most reliable indicator for adequate tissue perfusion is urine output. If you reassess, patients still have tachycardia, the blood pressure is reduced, patient is unstable, you repeat another liter of normal saline and you should know normal urine output is 30 to 50 mils per hour or more representing is 0 0.5 to 1 mils per kg per hour in adults or 1 to 2 mils per kg per hour in pediatrics and even in the unit is two to three mils per kg per hour urine output now after correction of dehydration and patient is making adequate urine or in the post-operative period the normal requirement of three liters of water and 130 millimoles of sodium is provided with one liter of Ringer's lactate and two liters of 5% dextrose water. You add vitamin B and C to the infusion. Now it is, remember please, don't forget this. It is after patient is making adequate urine. That is when you commence correction of potassium. It is when patient is making adequate, don't ever correct potassium when patient is not making adequate urine. Supplementary potassium is withheld for 48 hours in a trauma patient or post-operative patient. Why? Because potassium is released from bloodshed, damaged cells, and protein breakdown. That's why in our post-operative patients, you don't take samples for assessment of electrolyte within, within the first 48 hours. You have to wait for about 48 hours for adequate redistribution and re-equilibration between compartments. That is when you get the true picture. When the body have maintained stability and normal 
homeostasis. If there is nasogastric aspiration or other ongoing loss, it is replaced volume by volume. Hence, you should remember the principles of fluid and electrolyte therapy in a surgical patient is correction of deficit in form of dehydration, provision of maintenance fluid, which is the 24 hour requirement of that patient, provision of replacement of ongoing loss, which will come in form of diarrhea and vomiting, then monitoring of the patient to avoid over treatment and under treatment of the patient. It is important to hourly, you monitor the urine output hourly, you monitor the skin to go of that patient. Half hourly, you monitor the pulse and the blood pressure. You auscultate the lungs and monitor the JVP for fluid overload, jugular venous pressure. And if central line is in place, you should know, is 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. This is normal central venous pressure or eight to 12 centimeters of water. You should have what is called the input output charts where the total input in a patient and the total output of the patient in 24 hours is balanced. You now know the deficits. Where is it? Is it, are you overloading or you are giving below requirements? The next imbalance we'll talk about is fluid overload. Now, fluid overload, it is due to excessive administration, especially saline containing fluid. And the risk it is for it's occur commonly in patients who have difficulty in fluid handling, especially patients with hypoproteinemia, renal disease, hepatic disease, congestive cardiac failure. These are candidates that are prone to fluid overload. And you check this and modify your fluid administration in patients with comorbidities like this. Extremes of ages, and the, that is the elderly and in the neonates. Because the neonates have poor renal handling of fluid, and elderly, you know, progressively, they lose nephrons, they have poor renal handling and even cardiac handling. Patient will present with crepitations in the lungs when you are overload, when you overload them with fluid. That's why you frequently auscultate. They will have a raised central venous pressure, features of raised intracranial pressure. They may also have a prolonged post-operative ileus. Chest x-ray will show pulmonary infiltrates. Treatment, you have to stop IV fluid, give IV fusamide or manitol. Okay, the next topic is electrolyte imbalance. But however, we are going to stop the lecture here. Okay, if you have any questions, okay, you ask. So I'll allow you to unmute yourself if you have any questions or any question you've taken down, we are going to entertain questions. Thank you very much all for participating. So if you have a question, you can ask. Any question? Okay, it appears none of you have any questions. 